Good morning. And welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Logan. We are so glad that we've come together on this crisp, cold, well, cool. It's all relative, right? Cool day with the glorious sun to give thanks and praise to God. We're also very blessed that you've joined us on Facebook Live and later on YouTube. We come from north and south and east and west, from Fairfield County, from Hawking County, from all different counties to give thanks and praise to God. Let us worship God. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Shout out to God, all the earth. Break into joyful songs to the one true God. Sing of the glory, do his name, and offer the most magnificent praises. All your works are wonderful. The entire earth bows down to worship you singing songs of praise and glory to your name. Come, let's bless God together. Let's praise the one who gives us life and keeps us safe, who watches over us and keeps our feet from stumbling.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of grace, we bring to you our ingratitude for all that you have done for us, our impatience when prayers seem to be ignored, our selflessness when prompted to give or share, our faithness when wandering from your way. We ask for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ who gave all, that we might learn to do likewise. Amen. God challenges us, God encourages us, God confronts us and God accepts us. God works wonders in our midst and gives us the eyes, the heart, the soul to see each miracle. God forgives us, God guides us through the wilderness of the world. God leads us home. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us share signs of the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Holy God, your word is like fire. By the power of your spirit, illumine our sight and inflame our hearts, that we may live lives more faithful to your will. Amen. The first scripture this morning is from Psalm 66 verse one through nine. Tell everyone on this earth to shout praises to God. Sing about his glorious name. Honor him with praises. Say to God, everything you do is fearsome and your mighty power makes your enemies come crawling. You are worshiped by everyone. We all sing praises to you. Come and see the fearsome things our God has done. When God made the sea dry up, our people walked across, and because of him, we celebrated there. His mighty power rules forever, and nothing the nations do can be hidden from him. So don't turn against God. All of you people, come praise our God. Let our praises be heard. God protects us from death and keeps us steady. From Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus went along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men with leprosy came toward him. They stood at a distance and shouted, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. On their way, they were healed. When one of them discovered that he was healed, he came back, shouting praises to God. He bowed down at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. The man was from the country of Samaria. Jesus asked, weren't ten men healed? Where are the other nine? Why was this foreigner the only one who came back to thank God? 
Then Jesus told the man, you may get up and go. Your faith has made you well. saying it is to have the chancel choir back. Wow. It's just, oh. we, well, I think one, many things we have learned to appreciate coming through COVID. Uh, we're still coming through it, but uh, during the, the depth of it is I think we have learned to appreciate how important music is to us to hear the voices, to hear the instruments, to praise God with our total being, our voices, because music can express and convey meaning and truth that mere words can't. And thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to all of the choir. That's just beautiful. When I was preparing for um, today's sermon, I kind of scratched my head. Well, I do that most of the time, but I really scratched my head because I wasn't sure where the Spirit was leading me with this 
sermon because there's a lot of good stuff. It's a very meaty story, the ten lepers. It's very meaty. My homiletics professor told a story about a pastor colleague of hers who was um, teaching Sunday school with a group of children. That's always a slippery slope because you never know what they're going to say. You want to talk about truth tellers, it's a group of children. Um, and so they were, had read the story of the ten lepers and the pastor said, so what do you think about this story? And one little girl answered, Jesus must have been so happy that someone thanked him. Well, that's very insightful. That is a very positive, glass half full reading of this text. And I wish that was kind of the way that I was being led to bring this message to you. But you have to also pay attention to the harsh realities of the text. And there are several harsh realities of this text. I don't know about you, but I think Jesus is pretty brusque, maybe even kind of rude here in this passage. But he's trying to get a point across. And it's to sting to zap the ungrateful. It's not to praise the grateful. And the other thing that we need to notice is that Jesus doesn't really address the one leper that comes back. He kind of talks over his head. Right? He talks over his head. Because the story, the story is about a rebuke of the ungrateful rather than to praise the grateful. It's a very teaching story. And the third thing, which is really not politically correct, is Jesus specifically calls attention to the man's ethnicity. He is a foreigner, a Samaritan, why did he do that? Because the point of this story, and the story only occurs in Luke, is to chastise those among the Jews of the day, the insiders, the folks who should get it. But they don't show gratitude to Jesus and acceptance of Jesus. And it's also to give us a foretaste of the message and the mission to the Gentiles. Now let's be honest for a moment. Wouldn't it be better or easier to preach on this text if we could rewrite the ending the way the little girl wanted, you know, expressed it? There's so many scriptures I'd like to rewrite the ending. But how about this ending for this one? All ten of the lepers, when they saw they were healed, they rushed back and they praised God with one voice and they all fell down on their knees and thanked Jesus. Wouldn't that have been a better ending? Yes! Or how about this one? What if, if still that one person when he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice, you've got to be loud, right? He fell at Jesus' feet and Jesus said, it is so wonderful that you have come back to show your gratitude for your healing. And this is good things about you. It's a good habit to continue. Gratitude to God for all God's gifts. Now go in peace. Oh, we would really like that one, right? Well, if we've been paying attention to all these wonderful stories from Luke, Jesus didn't engage in ministry to be thanked. And it's a good thing, too, because a lot of people responded in many different ways but not often with thanks. 
Let's look at it a few things, a few examples. In chapter 5, I'm talking about Luke. In chapter 5, he cleanses a leper. And the response is to crowd around him wanting to be healed themselves. What about me? What about me? There was no thanks there. And then in chapter 6, the man with the withered hand, the response of Jesus' opponents is to be filled with fury, anger, and plot Jesus' demise. Quite the opposite of gratitude, wouldn't you say? And then in chapter 7, when Jesus raises a widow's son, again, the crowd is filled with fear. They're afraid. And what do you do when you're afraid? Typically, you shut down and go inward. And when a woman is healed by touching the hem of his garment, what does Jesus do? He sends her on her way. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And then when he heals a boy with a demon, the crowds are astounded at the greatness of God. And then there's that beggar, that blind beggar near Jericho. What did that man do? He followed him. He followed him. And the text says, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, praised God. Now, not all those reactions are bad, are they? No. But do you see gratitude in there? No. Jesus isn't interested in having people hang around and thank him. Often when he heals people, I don't think we hear him say, hey, stick around and thank me. Handwritten notes would be appreciated. But if you can't do that, a text or an email is fine. He usually says, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. It's kind of like graduation. Remember graduation, whether it was high school, college, graduate school, kindergarten, whatever it might be. You're, I mean, it's just the ultimate. And you go to the ceremony, and you're in your robe, and your hat, and you move your tassel over, all that good stuff. And you walk up on that stage, and you have your little card with your name on it, and you hand it to the, the person, and they read your name, and then you go over to another faculty member, usually the principal or maybe the college president. They shake your hand and they say, congratulations, keep on moving. <laughs> right? Keep on moving. It's kind of a stage direction that you need to keep the ceremony moving. But I think it's also good life advice. Jesus says to those he heals, congratulations, and keep moving. Don't stick around thanking me. You got work to do. Go on out there. It's very critical to this story, I think, that we understand the context. Because if we don't understand the context, I don't know that we can see the miraculous nature of what Jesus did here and what the Samaritan did. Today's reading takes place in the last stages of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. We all know what happens in Jerusalem. Jesus has been, since chapter 9 of Luke, traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. And if you're fortunate enough in your Bible to have those beautiful maps, you can look and see that from Gal Galilee to Jerusalem, somewhere along the way, he's going to get near Samaria. 
And this is a distinctive feature of Luke's story. There are more mentions of Samaria and Samaritans than in any other gospel. They occur the two chapters after the journey to Jerusalem begins and the two chapters before it ends. And you're like, well, what does that matter, Pastor Diane? Well, we have to understand who the Samaritans are or were and what their relationship to the Jews was. The Samaritans are different people, depending on who you ask. They are the lineal descendants of the northern kingdom, which has Samaria as a capital. Well, that's true if you ask the Samaritans. They are a mixed and confused culture that resulted from the Assyrians' practice of exile and resettlement. At least if you ask people of the ancient southern kingdom known as Judah. Now do you see a divide we have here? The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom? Oh, we've never experienced divides like that, have we? Or the Samaritans could be described as kind of a mishmash of commoners left behind by the Babylonians who intermarried with the mixed and confused remnants of the northern kingdom and with the pagans who inhabited the region. At least if you ask people who returned from the exile to find their homes and lands inhabited by others. Wow. Or the Samaritans could be the people who remember the same ancestors as the Jews and tell the same stories as the Jews. But like the Jews, are judged to be on the wrong side of the us and them divide. They just don't get along. And as my homiletics professor so wisely states, it's complicated. But what isn't complicated, as one theologian put it, is their leprosy. These ten guys had leprosy. Well, it probably wasn't Hansen's disease. Um, some people say it might have been eczema. It was some, some kind of skin condition that marked these people, that was visible, that you could see from afar. And because it marked them, it put them outside of the community. So they formed their own community outside the borders of the ordinary community. Lots of times when we hear this story, and frankly when I read it, the many times I read it before today, I, th I think those nine lepers, they're, they're, they're ungrateful boars, aren't they? They're just ungrateful. What's wrong with them? I would never do that. But let's have a word or two in their behalf. All of them approached Jesus. All of them approached him and called out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they knew something was special about this guy, right? They all obeyed his command to go show themselves to the priest. And as we hear their retreating footsteps, the flip-flop smack of their sandals, let's give them a little more respect than we usually do. They're heading in the direction Jesus told them to go. They're not heading home. They're not heading to go get a drink. They're not going to go play bingo. They're not going to do something 
that's bad. They're going to do exactly what Jesus told them to do. So let's cut them a little slack. They knew to whom to call out for healing. And they believed him when he said it was a done deal. Even before the evidence was before their eyes. He didn't say, um, go show yourselves to the priest, but on the way, as soon as you see your flesh cured, I tell it back to me with a thank you. Now, are any of you asking, why send them to a priest? Wasn't Jesus better than a priest? Hmm. Well, the purpose of sending them to the priest, those of you who know your Leviticus, don't we all, uh, was so that the cured person could officially resume their place in society. Right? It's kind of like getting that hall pass. Right? I have permission to walk down the halls. Right? The nine lepers, presumably Jewish, we don't know, but we presume they're Jewish, had their minds on the future. On resuming their life they had left behind with the onset of this illness. Their minds were full of scenes of reunions with their wives, their children, their family, re entry into the marketplace and the synagogue. And there's no indication that their goals and future actions were anything but respectable and legal. but they were lacking something. That's the point of the story. The one leper, the foreigner, the Samaritan, the enemy, who returned to God was made well. Whereas the other nine were merely cleansed or healed. I usually don't drop down to the level of semantics, give you a, you know, a Greek or a Hebrew lesson, but it's important in this scripture to know that there are two different words used here in the biblical text. The one that is used to describe the Samaritan is to heal of spiritual disease and death. To be cleansed or healed is to be made clean or healed of a disease. That's a physical cure. And it's used twice in the NRSV. And, but this is driving me nuts. And the other word that was used to describe the one who came back is referred to as salvation. Does that help? Does that make a difference? Do you see the point of the story, the teaching moment of this story? The insiders, the Jews, they were still cleansed, they were still healed. But the Samaritan, the outsider, the foreigner, the alien, the one that's living in a tent. Was saved. Received salvation. That's a critical 
point of this story. And we kind of lose this in the translation because we don't see the difference in the two words that as much as we know were originally used. Only the foreigner is grateful for the grace he received. The others think solely of the benefits received. The ungrateful nine exemplify the general attitude of the Jewish people towards Jesus' mission. And this Samaritan, this outsider, this outcast, this foreigner, this illegal alien is prophetic of the future response of non-Jews to the gospel. So this is a teaching moment on so many levels. And there is meant to be a connection in our minds and in the listeners' minds when this story was recounted between this account and what other parable? The Good Samaritan, where again there are two Jews, their minds thinking ahead to their liturgical duties, what they had to do next, and they neglect the wounded neighbor on the side of the road. So how does Jesus' emphasis on gratitude, on thanksgiving, impact our church? Our life. It seems to be more than proving to Jesus that we have good manners. In the passage, the leper returns and thanks Jesus. But note Jesus' interpretation of these words of thanks in verse 18. Again, he's talking over the head of the one leper who came back. Have you ever had somebody talk over your head? Usually your parents. Did you see what she did? I can't believe she did that. Well, she's your child. She's not mine. You know, that kind of thing. This is what Jesus is doing. He's talking over the head of the leper and he says, was no one found to return and give thanks to God except this foreigner? Why is gratitude to God crucial to wholeness of mind, body, and spirit and to what the New Testament calls Salvation. According to this story, apparently to be made well, we must add thanksgiving to our faith. The person who makes such an acknowledgement experiences a salvation that goes beyond the merely physical cure. It's a reorientation of the inner life. Do you think that Samaritan was ever the same? No. Mm -mm. Because I think, you know, these questions come up. So, how is our impulse to thank others related to our impulse to thank God? Do you think the Samaritan was more thankful to other people as a result of this? Are you more thankful to other people because God has blessed you, has cured you, has made you whole, and continues to make you whole each and every day? Whether or not your dis-ease is visible or not, Why is it so important that Jesus would chastise? Because that's what he's doing here. I bet he's doing this. 
Jesus would chastise those who didn't value gratitude to God. And does gratitude keep you connected to the giver of the gift? Ah, yes, I think so. I think so. And does gratitude keep us grounded in the value of the gift as we take it into new pursuits and places? If I'm grateful in here, what am I going to be like out there? If I'm grateful in my prayer life, what are it going to be like when I'm in driving in traffic? Maybe even in, in Pennsylvania. All good gifts come from God. And maybe the attitude of gratitude keeps us focused not maybe, it does keep us focused on the source of life, love, and grace each and every day. Maybe when we acknowledge the source of love, we are more likely to share it with others. If we articulate that gratitude, if we articulate that love, won't we share it? Maybe that is why gratitude is important enough for Jesus to lament its absence. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using an excerpt from a brief statement of faith. Let us affirm what we believe. We trust in God the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor. The same spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through scripture. And he teaches us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us pray. We bless you, O oh God, for your power and mighty deeds and tender mercies. We bless you, O oh God, for your watchful care in places of exile and at home. We bless you, O oh God, for your healing presence in sickness and in brokenness. We pray to you for the needs of the world for those enslaved by political, military, or social oppression, for those suffering from violence and illnesses we can prevent, for those at risk from famine, drought, and natural disasters. We pray to you for the renewing of creation for an end to harmful habits and willful ruin, for heightened care for species at risk, for more faithful stewardship among us toward Earth's resources. We pray to you for the cares of our community, for those who have lost jobs, homes, and hope, for those who are hungry today and will be again tomorrow. For those troubled in mind, body, or spirit, and for those recovering. We pray to you for the cares we hold this day, for patience and difficulty, for a renewal of commitment, for grace to forgive ourselves or another. Heal us, we pray, in our diseases, estrangements, and in the broken places of our lives. May we return to you, to creation, and to community in joy and thanksgiving according to your grace. Give your church fresh courage and bold vision in this changeful time as we pray for the welfare of all people. In the name of the one who came to heal and to save, Jesus the Christ. All this we pray in his name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who aren't in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, I'm speaking to you today as representing the Bowen House. Um, in your bulletin, you got a little brochure, and I wanted to um, point out a couple of special things. Um, the Sonex Saxophone Quartet will be playing October 22nd in the Bowen House. Um, these guys are professional. Uh, it should be a really, really nice concert. Um, you'll get to meet them and um, have refreshments afterwards. Um, I also want to highlight especially the um, piano concert um, on November 19th. Um, uh, last year, there were a number of students, they're masters or PhD level piano students, so they're very professional. It'll be a very, very nice professional concert. It's very special because um, our church, this, this church, is sponsoring the concert in memory of Bert Brennan. Um, 
so it makes it really special. I know a lot of us have really fond memories of Bert. So if you can come, please come. Uh, you can reserve a seat by calling the Bowen House. The phone number is on the back. Um, or you can, if you're tech savvy, you can sign up online. Or I'm going to be in Westminster House. If you want to let me know, I'll add your name to the list. Um, hope to see you all there. Martha. Are you going to open up the Bowen House after worship? I can, yes. The um, wonderful artists, the can-do creation artists, currently have um, the exhibit over at the Bowen House. It is phenomenal. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, Martha will open that up after she's had a chance to have refreshments. Yes. And you can go over to the Bowen House and see these wonderful creations from our brothers and sisters at um, HVI. Um, I also want to uh, thank you very much for your generous spirit. Uh, we collected close to $900. Thank you for the Peace and Global Witness offering, which is one of the four national church offerings. 25% of that offering will remain here for us to use in our peace and local witness reconciliation programs. So thank you very much for your generous spirit. You should have received in the mail, and if you didn't, come see me after worship, um, a letter from the Finance Stewardship and Property Team about our 2023 stewardship campaign. Uh, together for joy. And what a better hymn that we sang at the very beginning of worship, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Um, stewardship dedication will be on November the 13th, and we'll follow the worship service and dedication of our pledges by fellowship in Westminster House, and we're going to have all kinds of apple pie. Apple pie. Doesn't that sound good? Warm apple pie. Yes. Yes. We are called to practice gratitude, not only during this designated season of giving, but every day. And it will change our lives as individuals. It can change our life as a congregation. And in the spirit of gratitude to God, our giving is not reduced to an ethical duty, but it's elevated to delight and joy. As we offer to God these measured gifts, let us also offer unmeasured praise.
please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Ever-present God, you meet us in the borderlands and places neither here nor there at times when we are well out of our comfort zone. Even if we don't know where we're going, when we feel most lost, you are there. You meet each of us where we are, and many of us in our need, people marginalized by illness, not wanting to be a burden, those who see their poverty or problems as unacceptable, feeling rejected with faltering self-worth. It was in the borderlands that Jesus met a band of lepers whose livelihood was begging whose status was untouchable and touched their lives with hope. And it was the Samaritan, the one most of all an outsider, who turned back to give thanks. We thank you for all we can learn from our sisters and brothers who live on the edge, in poverty, in the borderlands. We can learn about gratitude, grace, and healing hope. Thank you, God. Amen. Just a reminder that we will have fellowship in Westminster House 
Everybody's welcome to fellowship, even if you don't attend the committee meetings afterwards. Everybody come. It's a time to share our gratitude with each other and to share our joy with each other. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.